thank you for everyone coming out tonight. Uh, I'm really excited about this event. Uh, we've dubbed it Voices of Resistance. Um, this, and for posterity, we are recording this event, so I'm going to go through. This is the greater suite of events that this is a part of. And just because we are recording it, what we've already done is it started last uh, Wednesday on the 15th. We did a documentary screening of the 2009 film Captured, uh, which is about Clayton Patterson and his documenting of the Lower, Lower East Side. Uh, he was on hand to introduce and do Q&A. Uh, we did something with the Interference Archive uh, here in the library on Wednesday. Uh, they came over and uh, talked about propaganda parties and how independent artists and designers can collaborate with community organizations to create and distribute their own political materials. I think because they are, they are an archive, I think they probably hold on to that ephemera. I don't know to what level they catalog it, so I won't speak of that. We had a crypto party about digital security. On Saturday, we had an art and feminism Wikipedia edit-a-thon, uh, which was really cool. Um, Last night, uh, in partnership with the MFA uh, Department for Social Documentary Filmmaking, we had a screening over there on the west side, which was great. There was uh, a great one by uh, Missouri undergraduates. Apparently, they had a professional uh, editor, but uh, a great movie about, uh, was it last year or the year before? There was a young gentleman on a hunger strike uh, because of some incidents in Missouri, but there was also some all the recent protests in New York and D.C. were documented, um, and uh, Standing Rock, and quite good. And now we're tonight, and tonight we have a great poetry reading. We have Bakar Wilson, we have Sheila Maldonado, we have Lydia Cortez, and mm -hmm. we have Patricia Spears Jones. So um, welcome. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. um, so. First up, and this, this microphone, uh, it's not projecting, it's recording, so that's just so you know. Uh, so first up, we have Bakar Wilson, my good friend. Uh, Bakar Wilson is a fellow of Kava Kanan and an alumni of the Squaw Valley Community of Writers. He has performed his work at the Bowery Poetry Club, the Poetry Project, the Studio Museum of Harlem, and the Asian American Writers Workshop, among others. His poetry has appeared in the Vanderbilt Review, Stretching Panties, The Brooklyn Rail, and Flicker and Spark, a contemporary queer anthology. A native of Memphis, Tennessee, Picard received his BA in English from Vanderbilt uh, and his MA in creative writing at City College. He is an adjunct professor uh, of English at the borough of Manhattan Community College, CUNY. Please make Picard feel super welcome. You. I can't help but look at the Ai Weiwei right here, which like is resist. Like this looks, this is resist to me. Like in the way he deals with, you know, with his art. So that's what we need to be doing. Um, thank you, uh, David, for inviting me, and thank you to the School of Visual Arts for having me. And thank you to my fellow readers who I'm fans of, all of you. Especially that one, Sheila. And Patricia. I work with Patricia. Lydia. Um, okay, so I'm just going to read poems. Um, I'll start out with this one. It's called. Um, just get my phone out so I can see if it's fine. So this is entitled Manhattan. With a modicum of grace, a smidge of integrity and intelligence, we move through this place like bumper cars, banging into walls, each other, clack clash of voices, screams, and throated violence. The niceness is cutting, cordial but with an edge, or telling someone's mama. People are people, even when they are being inhuman, the city can bring out the beast in the best of us, knocking down sky, skyscrapers, eating homeless people for lunch. Toast, a monologue. And I just have to say, like, um, before I continue, about like pol politicizing issues. Like, I feel like everything is political right now. Um, and 
including the body, including relationships, including our food, like everything's political. So this is Toast the Monologue. I'm not much of a breakfast person. I love my coffee. I love the bitterness of the morning. You love toast, though. I watch you every morning take out two slices of that seven grain bread you love and put it in the toaster I don't know how to use. I bury my head back into the New York Times and continue reading about the horrible state of the world. How can I think about toast when the world is going to shit? You seem less bothered by it as you sit down and spread, I can't believe it's not butter on your hot bread. It melts, it melts instantly because it's not butter. <laughs> I sip on my coffee, getting my mind ready for the bitterness of the day. I'm not coveting your toast, I'm just looking at it. Watching you enjoy it makes me happy. I am not bitter, it's the coffee that's bitter. I'm simply awestruck by how happy a piece of warm bread can make someone. I half expect you to have an orgasm right on the kitchen table. You don't though, you finish and get up to get ready for your day, which probably won't be as bitter as mine. Does eating toast make one feel better about his day? I'll never know. I hate the stuff. All I can do is hold on to my assumptions tightly, slowly squeezing the air out of them until they are as limp as I am. You continue to bounce around the house, humming some ridiculous song you heard on the radio. Part of me wants to tell you to shut up, but I sit and take it and sip on my coffee and read about our world, our city, I can't get the image of your toast out of my mind. It's distracting me now. I can't concentrate on what I'm reading. I slam the paper on the table. You're dressed at this point and look at me startled. I'm ridiculous in pajamas pissed off at toast. I go around collecting men. On Manhattan streets lit like Christmas, the avenue gives night on a plate. This time, in an adult bookstore, a glance, a hand, whose breath is this? Who's the one in anger? Outside, there is a fuck across the street in the truck. He rolls down his window, gives a grin, an avenue is crossed. Door to door. In a suit, I went door to door, the steaming hot sun staring at me like God's golden eye. Knocking on doors, I gave witness to all of his fine works. Quoted Bible verses, made Jesus my lover. Sometimes my mother was with me. Other times she was at home pleasing the father in other ways. Out in the streets, I was spreading his word, making him proud of me. I sat on plush couches in nice houses, a little black boy in white people's homes telling them about Jehovah, about the paradise earth his followers would inherit. My father, a void, hangs over me now without a word to anchor his soul. Close four. Cashmere, I want to dress my tongue in it. Let the soft, fuzzy fur coat my mouth. Maybe my distraction is tight jeans and little t-shirts that show off the physique. Sometimes I like zip-up sweaters. Other times I enjoy the convenience of a pullover. I pull him under. Let's not even get into shoes. We'll be here all day and night, which I'm not wholly against, but I feel like we can talk about other things, such as fabrics. Silk, for instance, should be hand-washed, loved, and worn sparingly. I should wear this man sparingly <coughs> instead of exhausting him all at once. I like button-down shirts. I appreciate clothes, but I prefer them on something else, like mannequins or the floor, someplace different where they may be admired. What about houndstooth or seersucker suits? but does it always have to be about patterns? 
the games you played. He is a man asleep on a couch. You are merely a boy whose curiosity and disdain has left you scorched. Socked feet skate on the hardwood floor in the living room. You wonder if he is really asleep as you slip your hand beneath boxer shorts. His dick is already hard. The cat, a witness, turns his head from the TV, blaring an infomercial, selling something. You know the cat doesn't know what's going on, but you can't help but wonder. He stares nonplussed as if he knows the repercussions. What happens next will run you like an engine runs a car into a ditch or off a cliff. Spectrum, orange. This tangerine dream starts me awake. Eyes are a witness to a citrus reality. The nose recognizes juicy ways in burnt caramel. Outside this window, a harvest moon makes flamed promises, lighting an already artificially lit night. Electric sages predict the future. They rely on their inner glow. A clementine wish escapes moist lips, hangs in the air, and evaporates. A carrot stick dangled in front of the mule. What about this nectar? A jeweled peach glistens, a prequel to the cream. I will just rely on the sharpness of this cheddar. It is always on time. Three wishes. Hi, I see you there, yeah. Three wishes. Rub the genie of the lamp the right way and he will grant you three wishes. A fertile body garden full of plump, ripe limbs longing to be touched, plucked. A son of a vision, he will be my pride and joy, my liquid message spilled from heaven. A rain dance, including thunder and lightning that leaves me waterlogged. Three wishes, too. Rub the genie of the lamp the wrong way, and he will take three things away from you. Your name, your father, your promise. Same-sex coupling. He works me like a jigsaw puzzle, scattered with blotches of gray dawn. And I don't want to be a hooker on the run, People are constantly after you. They put your name in their mouths and spit it out, fractured, fiery. I want to move around in elegant tension with a man who knows how to pluck and plunder with the best of them. A caged beast released to play. A caveat presented at the right time. How are we doing, we okay here? Okay, good. Um, the last line? Yes. A caged beast released to play, a caveat presented at the right time. Thank you for asking. s and Secular modernism. Scholastic manipulation. Sloppy meltdown. Satin malignancy. Savior misfit. Stale memento. Saintly masochistic, supine mister, sensual malediction, salty marrow, subtle minstrelsy, sperm mess, sassy monster, shady marriage, shaft magnet, sadist memorabilia, sweetly manhandled, Sex malfunction, suddenly metaphysical, shish kebab meat. Shish kebab meat. Meat. M E A T meat. Like shish kebab. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just gonna read. <laughs> that looks fabulous. I love that. Um, okay. I just realized that like, I feel like 15 minutes to read and 
barely read for 10 minutes. Um, okay, so. I'll read this one. Also part of the Spectrum series. And so the Spectrum series, um, so basically what I did is I went into um, paint stores and took the like little chips with the paint names for different colors and like used the names of the colors to generate the palm. So, so this is Spectrum Blue. And so um, a lot of the, so most of the palm is, are words or names of the various colors. So this is Spectrum Blue. Relax and cozy. Fountain mist, Pacific pearl, a siesta key that ship shapes water, jet streams toll bells. Spring flowers feather soft into the sunlight, gasping, bright and lively. Windswept, timeless, and celestial. The, sca the sailing sky is all jazz and symmetry. Lavender twilight is rising, pearl violet premonition natural and comforting. It is almost slate. Take a winter walk, exhale white fog. Astoria glass, an island view, smoke gray are all present until a midnight haze. City streets, a monologue. Sorry, I have to like. City streets, a monologue. Nobody is saying it's your fault, Arthur. I, hope, I overheard a woman say on my way to the subway. I looked to see a family of four standing on the corner of 8th Avenue and 34th Street. They are clearly tourists and they are clearly lost. I consider helping them out, showing them that New Yorkers can be nice, kind, helpful people. I decide against that, of course, because really I can't be bothered, especially by tourists, because who has the time? I continue down into the subway and head back to Brooklyn. You hardly see tourists there, thank God, not even in Prospect Park. They're all in Central Park, getting their rocks off, taking pictures of strawberry fields or the fucking reservoir. I used to go to the Rambles when I lived uptown in Harlem. Best cruising in the city far removed from the more popular parts of the park. Men are fruit dangling from trees, ripe for the picking. Nothing beats outdoor sex. There's something very primal about it. It's just you, a stranger, no names exchanged that would ruin the experience and nature. <laughs> it's how God fucking intended. The Rambles is notorious for the gay sex. I don't think I ever saw any tourists there. On the train back to the BK, these two women, women are gossiping about a friend. Well, you should have seen her all over Beth's friend Cam at this party. She was shameless. Ugh, she's such a slut. I wonder if my friends talk about me like that. I'm pretty open about my sluttiness, so it's common knowledge not something that any of them would salaciously discuss on the L train. And considering the things they've said to me to my face, I figure what they're saying behind my back is really nothing to worry my pretty little head about. But maybe I should have helped those tourists. <laughs> Grinder vibing. So for those of you who don't know, Grinder. Okay, good. So Grinder is this. <laughs> it's totally like educate you on this. So Grinder is this in, this um, little um, what's it called app? It's an app where you can meet guys to date or hook up with. It's specifically for gays. It is specifically for gays. Yeah, it is a gay app. So you can go on and like chat with people and like hook up or date whatever. It's strictly for gays. There are no women allowed. No women allowed. I'm so sorry. Well, you know, I, th I mean, let's not get. I mean, I can totally talk about like the issues about like women and sexual. Well, I, f I feel like women should have an equally, you know, women app where they can also hook up with women or men. Tinder's crap. I know. I know. 
It's called her? Oh, I had no yeah. idea. That's what that slogan was all about. Oh, awesome. I will let all of my friends know about her. Okay. Just <laughs> I'm just going to read now. Okay, so, so, I know, I, I, you shouldn't go there. Um, so some of these lines from this poem are taken from actual um, Grindr um, profiles. Grinder vibin. This is like window shopping for dicks. Very horny, very horny cocksucker here. Here for kicks. I'm on a hunk hunt. Brooklyn, you dig? Most of you terrify me. I hope you step on a Lego. And I hope you step on a Lego in the dark. I'm not sis. Don't be rude. You can live your life or mine, but you can't live both. For your mind and your ass will follow. Anybody can take off his clothes, but can a bitch hold a decent conversation? Ask him to tell you more about himself. I want to be so ugly, I'm beautiful. Let me do the splits on your face. Am I the only hopeless romantic left? Ask away. Do you want to get high off of my love? Just like you, I get horny too. Boulders of black diamonds carved with bows, saws, metal teeth, and blasts of human breath await. Inhale the terms of this service. Your name is alive now. All right, so I will close. I'm done. I will close with this poem, which is very political. I should have been a gay porn star. And this is for Donald Trump. <laughs> I should have taken to the valley and started a new life as a versatile fucker. I look okay naked. I've definitely seen worse in porn, both gay and straight. For example, Ron Jeremy. I mean, really. You would watch me in all of the categories. Daddy videos, muscle hunks, big black cocks, twinks, Latin poppies, and so on. I last way longer than they do without the Viagra or the fluffers because I'm just that good. I'd lie to my family about how I'm making my fortune, tell them that I work in real estate, even though I've never been that good with money. I'd have porn star boyfriends with hot bodies and big dicks. We'd fuck until we were bored with each other and move on. The drugs and alcohol would flow whenever I wanted because who gives a fuck? I'm a fucking porn star. Maybe my friends will be superficial and vapid, only hanging out with me because of my fortune and, hed and hedonistic fame, but it's LA. <laughs> it's okay, because I just want people surrounding me, basking in my pornographic glow. I'd probably do what every porn star wants and cross over to legit films and become Hollywood famous. Or maybe my life would turn into boogie nights, but the gay version. Instead of roller girl, there's roller guy. We fall in love and fuck off into the sunset. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Please, one more time for Picard. That was okay, up next, we have Lydia Cortez. <clears throat> Lydia is a Williamsburg-born Williamsburg Puerto Rican and the author of two collections of poetry, Lust for Lust and Whose Place. Uh, her work appears in the, the anthology of Puerto Rican poetry from Aboriginal to Contemporary Times, Breaking Ground, uh, anthology of Puerto Rican woman writers in New York, 1980 to 2012, Monologues from the Road, a play, through the Kitchen Window, Teaching with Fire and Praise of Our Teachers. Uh, and she was awarded uh, a fellowship at the Valdeprezo Artist Retreat in Spain, uh, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and at the McDowell Colony. So, uh, <laughs> uh, McDowell Colony. Sorry, there was just, I was thinking back to the repetition of the last line. <laughs> um, please make Lydia feel super welcome. Okay. Um, 
um, tried to put together a memoir in poems, and I keep veering off course. But I think I have about two of them I'll share with you anyway. And the others, I don't know what they are. <laughs> so this is called Release Time, which I think will be the name of the memoir. I wanted us to die all together, if and when we had to die. The best way to do it was together. Papi and Mami and my little sister, Sonia, and my little brother, Freddie, and me. That way, no one would have to cry for no one would have to miss the others. It wouldn't matter if we died with sin. Original or any other kind, mortal or venial, we'd all go together, I prayed. We'd just decide one day to lie down together, crossways on mommy and papi's big bed, <coughs> holding hands. Mommy with papi and papi with me and me with my sister and her with our baby brother and close all our eyes tight and go in peace, bye-bye, we'd end up all in the same place, happy in heaven or suffering for some time in purgatory or forever in hell, but all still together, we'd be without having to cry ever in this life for one or the other. That's how we get around the stories full of fear learned in release time every Wednesday afternoon. And <clears throat> this poem, actually, Patricia um, was a curator for a series of poems online, and she published this one. Another September, mommy believed in the good and the bad, clear cut black and white back in 1957 when in black and white we watched cowboy TV shows. A bit into the story, she'd interrupt the narrative with her who's and who's. Quien es el malo? Quien es el bueno? She'd interrupt many, many times, though the good ones she'd guess by the color of his hat and outfit. The one in white, no? El blanco, no? The bad one, black head to toe. El negro, no? In those days, it was easy to tell the good from the bad, but she wanted to be doubly sure to keep her good and bad in their place. Mommy was afraid for ese Martin Luther King Jr. we saw on TV and the kids in Arkansas. King was el negrito bueno. Still, if he didn't watch it, that negrito bueno was going to get himself killed, was going to get those poor nine niños most dressed in pure white killed in Little Rock. Killed didn't matter if they too were good like Los Buenos in the TV shows, that he looked like El Buen Negrito, that he was a minister, hombre de Dios. Wasn't good enough, Mami lamented. Couldn't he just keep good and quiet, looking like the all in white cowboys, Los Buenos, deep down she always knew who were the good to pray was okay, but nonviolence, mommy feared, was asking for it. Ay, bendito. I saw them perform. This poem is for A.L. Nielsen after um, I took a Lorenzo Thomas workshop with him at the Poetry Product. Po product, yes, the poetry, poetry Product. It is sometimes <laughs> a Poetry Product, and sometimes it's a project, and sometimes it's a place where you read, and sometimes it's a place where they ask you to read, but most times it's not. I saw them.
perform for A.L. Nielsen after Lorenzo Thomas' workshop. I saw these people perform. I heard the Beach Boys, White Boys, Tommy Sands, and Pat Boone, though don't think they ever came to Brooklyn. Did Pat Boone ever come to Brooklyn, to the Fox Theater, to the Alan Freed shows? For the Freed shows, he was perhaps too white, too scared for downtown Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn Negroes. Oh, too low down for that Pat White, that sugar cube would have melted to liquid in a Brooklyn Bronx or Lower East Side minute would have been sucked up, sucked dry, fucked up and fried. But I did see Chuck Burries. I saw the Chuck Burries, the Platters, the Fats Dominoes, the Chubby Checkers, the Day Baby Cortez guys, and so many others. I heard the white boys on TV, but after seeing the guys at the Fox Freed shows, I liked, I dreamed the dark better, the darker, the better, darker, always more intriguing, more dark. The white books I read, Gone with the Wind and the Romance Ones, Sex Innuendo, Color Covers, Dime Store, Soft Covered, Selling Soft Sex Books, talk always of swarthy, swarthy combos of sexy and swirly, swarthy and something snaky, somewhat undulating, something a bit sinister, dark, was always more intriguing, grabbing my imagination, vagination, where I had to keep it caged up cause it wasn't good, maybe evil, to even think of liking black boys, black men that way. What what would mommy say? Never say black, say negro, say negro, never say negro. Never mind papi thinking sin, sinful enough, I'd need confession, lots of confessing to some beefy, red-faced, Irish, happy St. Patty's Day priest. Something to make his weak, my weakness, the pretty PR girl barely out of quinceañera, confessing sins of darkness, desire of the black and the brown, something taboo, boo-hoo, something to cry for, to maybe warrant crying out for, to even be beat up for, something richer, tastier, more satisfying, never to be let on, about to be let out or be left in the sand alone and marked with a big black mark on the forehead, on the chest, maybe, maybe even on her bare chest, maybe even on her bare ass. Letters seen as she walked away or came, saying, reading, bleeding out, bleeding. She did it, she did it. Oh, si, senor. Lo hizo, not Luisa. But she, Lilin, did it, and she did it. I told you she could, she would. I saw, I saw it in her eyes. From there it slipped, it slid right out of her. That let on look slid out her eyes, the sweet, thick, honey tears she did. Lo hizo, lo hizo con un negro, con un negro. Oh, no, no puede ser, un negro, no, quizás un negrito, fue un negrito, the diminutive just a bit, a tiny bit better to say only a bite, only is what she wanted, would that satisfy? Doubt it, once she tasted the dark, she'd want more, she did, she did, she did it con un negrito, ay Dios mío. What to do, que escándalo, buscando lo prohibido, she'd do better with one of her own kind. She should stick with her own kind of kid, uno casi blanco, a tan boy like that, a boy casi bueno, con pelo casi bueno, almost there, but she wanted, she always wanting, wanted the more exciting, the one who could dazzle with a little fear enough to titillate como el Sammy Davis, ese Sammy Davis Jr., amazing, the tricks he could do, where he could go, and did he make her laugh? He did dazzle her. 
She was all frazzled after one of his performances. Her showboy, could he perform, made her foam at which, which mouth perform in her imagination, vagination, the time they'd spent together in the secret. Of course, that's the only, only way it could be, his being so black, so slight, so brilliant, with all that brilliantine pomade, so overwhelming in his smallness, he whelmed, he whelmed her away, almost stopped it really, if not took it away completamente. Ese negrito, papi would say, when they, he and his nenas, watched at El Solibancho on some Sunday, he, papi, had no idea, gracias a Dios, what was going through and round and round and round his little girl's mind, his nena's body trembling for joy, for release, only inches from his negritud. That's real negritud. That I don't give a shirt off my back, give a shit, don't fuck with me tood to the tune of, I did it, and I'll do it, do it again, do it my way, okay? <laughs> and this is, I guess this is a political one. <laughs> Zig, <laughs> zag. Up and down, black brutal slices up and down. He slices till his mark is there on the page, looking like a, a chart, a bad Wall Street week ending on the down, 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 and out executing his executive, loves playing, thinking he's the executive, zig and zag, up and down, mark slashes of furiously black as crude oil marks besmirching the virginal white vellum surface a miracle the texture of the paper doesn't give tear apart given the rage of the red freckled hand red manhandling fear red-handed stout fingers ending in claws grip the pen as it rips up then slashes down violating paper vile hand violence in each stroke meditated this creep needs medicating killing whatever he feels in his way the paper suffers the pain suffers the blow of his pen the thick strokes black as his heart his brain dumb numb as he feels nothing feels little nothing means much to him mean as he is has he a heart never mind a soul should he have one? Yes, he should, but there is doubt about how someone so cruel, as crude as vulgar, could have one a soul, would find it hard to live in his innards, being in that big Mac rotting carcass of a host for very little other than small thoughts, ignorance, heavy meanness for its own sake. No amount of riches could redeem, make him seem any better than what you see, what you hear, what you fear. This creature before us is always before us, puts himself always first to grab the p p prize, spoils first to execute the order wants to be presidential. The executive, he thinks he is power. He scowls, thinking power. He scours, scrapes away all good uses, executive power to put down those he claims lesser than he, the ones who never win, the losers, the poor of shelter, food, the ones deprived of peace, even negates a bit of peace of mind to those in flight Seek, seeking refuge, he sees as refuse, he seizes the day, the big man, the little leader who can't see, has no vision, he can't talk, makes no sense, won't read, can't thread five words to cohere a sentence, this little bit of a man, if you insist that's what he is, this creature rare as raw meat left out to rot on the counter, 
He stinks, sinks to low hell, but boy, give him a pen that can make broad strokes up and down, hard in and out, to feel like a man, decisive in action, derisive indeed. Give him that pen, the bigger extension of his smaller appendage. Give him that pen he wheels straight up, then as violently down, nasty strokes that execute nonsense, nothing good, executing like a murderous machete, this guy, though, ain't no macho, macho man, but man, can he make those ugly strokes, big, callous, thick as his gray matter, whatever may dwell there is not much more than meanness that festers there between his red ears under the pastiche of orange patch above his red neck. Oh, but with that pen, he is accomplished as a kid enraged at his mama, that mother's son, that mother of an SOB who got too little titty, that now we see getting even, executing orders, furious, mad little red-faced kitty, paying back his mama and us all for the way too little whiny willy, this whiny willy got white, got which may explain why he cries out so often, as if maligned. No wonder it's true. He got way too little, got hind titty, pushed there by the other brothers and sister, back relegated to hind quarters, back of the bus to the littlest of titty, that boy child you can't in any truth call a man. He never grew to grown up. Stayed a child, vengeful, spiteful little thing. Poor little thing, though, surrounded by gilt gold, cold marble palaces, vulgarity mirroring his emptiness, his greed, and lack of love, even humanity. If I believed in prayer and some merciful being above us all, I'd offer a prayer, at least chant to high heaven for his salvation. Hallelujah, and Ave Maria Purissima, y que Dios lo bendiga, y Jesucristo, to save his soul. But I can only offer up this raging rant. This is my raving incantation for this man whose petty lips permanent, permanently pursed into a pout of an infant, still sucking at mama's tit, even whilst torn away from its still sucking rare air. Thank you so much, Lydia. Parched people. Um, okay, I think we, we will motor along here. Um, next up, we have Patricia Spears Jones. Uh, Spears Jones poetry collections include Painkiller, Femme du Monde, and The Weather That Kills. Her work has been featured in numerous anthologies, including Angels of Ascent, a Norton anthology of contemporary African American poetry. Starting today, 100 poems for Obama's first 100 days. Uh, Black Nature, Four Centuries of African American Nature Poetry, and Best American Poetry. She's a contributing editor at Bond Magazine. Spears Jones has also served as a program coordinator at the aforementioned Poetry Project at St. Mark's Church and led the New Works program for the Massachusetts Council of Arts and Humanities. Um, her inc honors include an appointment as Senior Fellow for the Black Earth Institute, grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and the New York Foundation for the Arts. Awards for the Foundation for Contemporary Art and the New York Community Trust. Uh, with residents at Yaddo, Bredlow, uh, the Malay Colony, the Squaw Valley Community of Writers, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. A uh, resident of New York for more than 30 years, Jones has taught at LaGuardia Community College and Queens College, uh, CCNY, Parsons, the New School, and the College of uh, New Rochelle. She lives in Brooklyn, and please uh, make Patricia feel very welcome. That's an ancient bio, but anyway, uh, I realize that this uh, thing doesn't really 
project, so let me know if you can hear me or not. Uh, it's very strange to be on this um, street because I was thinking about this. Um, uh, I lived in New York for more than 30 years, it was more like 40. Uh, and uh, uh, Planned Parenthood used to be across the street, just down the street from here, and I was thinking about that today. So I'm going to start with, um, obviously, the um, women's right to choose uh, right now is under assault uh, now across the country. Uh, so the idea of being able to get an abortion if you need one um, is uh, really under attack. And one of the ways in which uh, this is being done is, of course, in, uh, in, in state legislatures, uh, throughout the country, and, and Texas, of course, leads the way. So one of the things they do is they now make, uh, if you actually can even get an abortion, you're supposed to then pay for the funeral of the, the fetus, which is absurd. The room behind the room. Lethal police force was used to ensure the funeral of the fetus left behind. In a room behind the other room where the doctors met and talked about football. Or that is the story told by the good elders of the forever praising his name church, even if his name is not actually called. They wanted to hang her or burn her, the woman in the room behind the room, where the doctors talked about football. But burning women remains taboo. Hanging women seems redundant. And so shooting her was more acceptable. The lethal police did what lethal police is told to do. And once done, another funeral, another grave. Another wave of disgust rises in Texas, in the Texas streets like heat in July, it shivers, and shivers the doors and windows of offices where the doctors talk about football and sorrow and the indecent moaning of state lawmakers. Their cries recall the voice of vultures after feasting. Um, this is a poem, I rarely read this, but it seems appropriate. Um, the epigram is white buildings in, in crematorium style where the dream of the poor turns to ash. Uh, it's from Thomas Trans Transtromer's The Indoors is Endless. What dream? The poor only have one dream in his poem. Does winter make the dream of heat the only one? The coal fire is dead in the crates ash, he says. Or is it the dream of walking quickly, confidently, in spring's lightly heated air? Is it heat of any sort, this dream? Or what else is missing? Food, love, stability? Every can in the gutter shivers. Gas leaks in old pipes. Wind weary squirrels and birds. The poor dream one dream of spring. The budding leaf of its heat while the rich need not dream, but they must dream, they have an advantage. Sleep sound enough to allow minds to wander across galaxies, delve into elixirs, dive off the jagged rocks of sequestered beaches, to where life, sea life gambles in an array of colors, dis disinterested with a human's flapping feet. Um, this is a weird poem. I wrote this um, three years ago. Uh, and it was based on, I think a lot of you remember in the um, 1980s, a series of child murders took place in Atlanta. And during that time, people started wearing green ribbons in um, solidarity or you know, to show that they cared in some way. Uh, and, um, and somehow I, I had this idea about ghosts carrying those green ribbons. And this is the poem that came out. And I put it away for a long time and I sent it off 
to, you know how you write something, you send it out because people say, please send me three or four poems, and you go, okay, I'll send this one. Nobody will do this. And then they published it, and we're like, oh, I guess it's good. <laughs> Green ribbons flutter and reside on lapels of women and some men. Green ribbons for the dark skin, skinny, chubby, light complected boys and girls. Green ribbons for their safe return, intact, smiling, scowling, howling, cursing, happy, oh, those dreams of happy endings. Everyone dreams of happy endings. But Atlanta is where endings are ambiguous. Tomorrow, another day, endings find the bloodied leg, the missing digits, the raped vagina, the cut off ear, the eyes left open for the birds, or gently shut to mark tears. See no more, see no more. Desperate are the mothers searching the wind for the sound of sneakers. Desperate are the mothers who have not received that phone call. Desperate are the mothers who gave their children money to pick up milk at the corner store. The cameras frame a tired woman's tired face, a tired man's tired face. The abundantly furnished living room cluttered but clean. The microphones are probed into the innermost sadness of parents bereft. The mayor intones emergency. Police beat bushes, beat up the older children, beat the time spent not worrying about dark skin, skinny, chubby, light complected children, beat themselves. Why can't we catch this monster? The kudzu, an immortal, wraps the light poles and fences and drowns the air with thick green madness. All summer long, the children walk into the green darkness and return as ghosts. Ghosts scorch the green fields where they met the blasted heat of hatred. Promise ended, tomorrow is someone else's day. Waving a kind of greeting to the newly lost. These ribbons impel a terrible keening each time they are pinned to dresses, blouses, suit coats, jean jackets, green, green ribbons for the skinny, chubby, dark skinned, light complected boys and girls caught in the deep verdure of the city primeval. Thus, the ghost stalk, the corner store, and basketball courts, the holiness church where the minister sweats a flood of salvation. They walk the halls outside the boys' and girls' lavatory. They watch over the babies and shake their heads when a mother smokes a pipe with no tobacco and a father is a victim of a drive-by. They scorch the green fields with their ashy limbs running fast. They scour the distant wires, loving the chatter of black birds. They sing sometimes, but only their parents can hear them. When they do, they think red clay and graves. I like that there are all these poems about um, sort of like desire and other kinds of things. And Lydia, boy, that A.L. Nelson uh, uh, workshop must have been a hot one. <laughs> All right, uh, anyway, this is a fun poem. Uh, and and uh, Pam Yusuk, uh, who this is dedicated to, is a terrific poet from uh, the West. And she edits a magazine called Cutthroat, uh, which did a great um, uh, anthology called Truth to Power, Poems Against the Rhetoric of Hate and Fear, um, which I, I'm in, a lot of other people. and. Uh, there's about a gazillion of these anthologies out now, but they're all um, they're all pretty interesting. Anyway, I just uh, I wrote this for her. Lipstick considered. Ah, to have a blossomed color by lipstick. Nature saluted and mutated by chemistry. Elizabeth Taylor lipstick bloom, poet says. But which Elizabeth Taylor lipstick? The lush reds hinted in those brightly lit black and white movies say a place in the sun or the soft blush fake innocent pink 
from Butterfield 8. Mark in the mirror, not for sale. I love that. Anyway, okay. It's one of the great moments in, 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 in cinema history in terms of women. Not for sale. Oh, what Technicolor could have done with those smears? And these blooms in the Arizona desert, angling towards or away from the sun's rays, scars vast regions of America's south and west. We can only speculate how those blossoms bless their beauty or curse it. How they bless this blush of red, this smear of pink, the lips once generous with flesh, now less so. But the pot of color is discovered that almost imitates those desert blossoms, their natural rouge. And the poet's movie star shimmers in the night sky near her planet, Venus, seen so easily too far to touch. <laughs> Celia Cruz, this is for, we had an interesting, you got to say, we had an interesting winter, okay? Celia Cruz, Snow Angels. The great Gatsby jazzed the sorrows of summers where the wealthy misspend their wealth making the president elect an apt arbiter of a future dulled by greed. Thus, the hero dead by his rival's gun tells this harsh truth, love does not conquer, lakes are for icing over. The versions come as random as this afternoon's mumble of news and sorrows and ice flakes. Ah, Celia Cruz, Cuban Spanish Brightens, what is she saying, and is it Spanish? <laughs> Outside, children in puffy jackets and Christmas scarves are lying on their backs in the new snow that takes their bodies offering. There's laughter, and moms, and dads, and cousins, and friends remember their time in snow's embrace. Angels, those bodies become angels, brought down to earth and printed in snow. What proof have we of those mystical, mythical creatures? Do angels laugh? Do they wear puffy jackets and patterned scarves? Do they, once returned upright, begin to fall snow into projectiles and smash their kin? Are they cursing this whiteness? Do they hear Celia Cruz, potent voice, singing in Spanish? Or maybe it is not Spanish, but another tongue, denser, deeper, from a haven on this earth that she hears on blue days when the snow falls and children stuff themselves into winter's heaviest fabrics. Then they fall quickly or slowly into a crystalline heaven, their winged arms and leaping feet caught in the beat between sound and sorrow. A couple more. So I had to do this darn reading on January 20th, which I did not want to do. But anyway, they made me do it. And so I had to write an actual, like, you know, poem. You know, I still contend that this is this is this is a time for prose. <laughs> okay. January twentieth, weather report. It may well be the weather's bright in the Middle West, where cornfields and factories and big cities bloom and bust. It may well be the weather's warming the tip of the south, where the tropic winds that brought slave owners from the Bahamas to the Carolinas blow. It may well be that the west coast beaches are crammed with surfers and tourists and the seekers of different divinations, their prayer beads and ambulance dangling. But here in the east, the skies are gray, the day gloomy not even a foreshadowing. This is where the storms of our dialogues meet the storms in the air. What comes forth from the tongue of the 45th will be documented, archived, and swiftly forgotten in the relentless sad weather to come. Or maybe only the East will feel it because 
it is where the American experiment started, and for some, of, uh, and for some, it could be where it ends. That's gloomy. But I am from the South, the temperature, the temperate part where ice storms are as likely as sunsets as far as the eye can see. Those long horizons give me the power to see farther and beyond this day, the next few years. And even in the gloom today, there is light in the laughter, love in the muddling through, generosity in the space where those whose hearts are full and minds expansive create their own weather and map their desires for a nation better than the one that presents itself, all red, white, and blue of it, marching backwards in sequence, the closed down circus come to town. Now, since other people had all these sort of sweet and lovely poems about desire and stuff, uh, I'm gonna end with two. One is, well, one is, the, you, you didn't read the, what was the poem she was supposed to read? Oh. Oh, okay. I thought I heard, I thought, it, okay, she was good. Oh, you were gonna read River Phoenix. Okay, so I'm gonna read the Prince poem. Well, you know, Prince left us. But remember the thing about Prince is that he was from the Twin Cities. He was from Minneapolis, folks. He was a Midwesterner. So, Prince on the Prairie Home Companion and Invention. Don't be messing with Prince and, and the Prairie Home Companion. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> After the song about buttermilk biscuits or a horse named Buttermilk, the eye-shadowed one emerges in a cloud of streamers, purple and gold. He sits before the baby grand, a wan smile crosses his heart-shaped face, and then he sings an old hymn, I'll Fly Away, or Is It the Beautiful River? Garrison Keeler joins in for some tremulous harmony, and the audience sits hushed and bothered, their faith exalted. An ecstatic chorus ends, then Keeler tries for some banter, but once the piano keys are no longer struck, up stands this tiny regal man. He gives a slight bow to his host, to the audience, and then departs. An odd commercial follows for faux shampoo or power tools, who can remember? The streamers crisscross the stage until janitors broom them away. And golden glitter streaks, the, streaks on the piano keys while Keeler's tears are not seen. He knows another man of the plains has left his mark. Those chords, his voice, mascara in the green room. And I'll end with this because it was so much fun to write. And, to, you know, a couple of years ago, I went to see, La, I went to La Casita at uh, 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 Lincoln Center, and these Brazilians came out and performed. Yeah. And one of them, and they were doing, you know, capoeira, hey. And one of the dancers had a black feather tattoo. The man with the black feather tattoo pairs the space between fantasy and the memory of a man's carved torso designed for stroking and celebration. Today, the sun's brightness is like that lover's kiss, wonderful in the present and greater in memory. A memory that brings me back to that black feather's flutter Stars dazzle in some other part of this world where the sun has set and the moon illuminates swans diving into voluminous waters. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. So we're down to one. Um, <laughs> uh, what? And uh, resist resistance. So well, that's, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's doing the job no matter what. So, uh, so next and last is Sheila Maldonado. Uh, she's a good buddy of mine, and she's a New York-based artist who was born in Brooklyn. She's the author of One Bedroom Solo, uh, published by Fly by Night Price, uh, Press, A Gathering of the Tribes in 2011. Uh, her re awards and residencies include the Canto Mundo Fellowship, the Pushcart Prize Best of the Small Presses nominations, the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance Creative Grant, the Cultural Envoy to Honduras, U.S. State Department, uh, the Teachers and Writers Collaborative Rockefeller Brothers Fund Residency, uh, and then we just got, she received a BA in English and American Literature from Brown University and an MA in English uh, Creative Writing Poetry from the City College of New York. Uh, please welcome Sheila Maldonado. <laughs> The among family, really, because it's all it's all family here. So I really, everyone's from every part of this little poetry. Life. Um, so yeah, all right. Yeah, no. Um, actually, I'm going to start with a poem I wrote for you for Black Earth Institute, like a while back. Um, yeah, Patricia was a teacher. Lydia, I met. I, did I meet you in the classroom? No, I met you before, probably, um, or no, at the same time. In, in literature. Oh, yes, that's right. Oh, yes, like even six years we before that. And we were in literature and letters. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, the, yeah, that was a while back. Again. So 15, 16, 17 years, 17, 18 years. Holy <laughs> mother. <laughs> oh. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> and yeah, Bakar, it's just everyone's family. Lydia's family, everyone's family, Jay's family. It's great. Okay, so this is, uh, so I'll start a little political and then I'll deteriorate into saying God knows. Pregnant while brown for the laws of Arizona. This is, you know, because this crap has been going on forever, so this is just the culmination of the crap. Um, pregnant while brown. I was pregnant with a book, a brown book. Every month pregnant, every month brown. Birthing documents, long forms, short stories, hidden histories, Tall tales, tongue twisters, pregnant every month. A bloody flight from two Nogaleses pregnant with a bloody book on the brown side of history in the arid Spanish native lands, ink expelled, blood erased. Pregnant every month with unwanted words, wrapped in a certificate, abandoned, womb text, a border infiltrated, pages smuggled, crumpled, bleeding brown. History, a fugitive in the womb. This is Peluche Perdido, Plushy Lost, Disney Central Americans in Times Square, and it's for those guys who dress up like Elmo. Um, is it one or the other no, there's the other ones too, you know, all of them. <laughs> Mini, et cetera. Mickey. 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 Yeah, all of them. Elmo. My cousins. My cousins. <laughs> 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 there's an Elmo on the Beast. Fuzzy, red, blurry, atop the train, traversing Middle Earth. He's coming north for a smile, a buck. What was taken? What was promised? You fear he will fondle your child in the crossroads of the clock. El molester, U.S. abused, peripherally addled by animation and supremacies. He's with Minnie, her bow fluttering in the train whoosh, disc eyes aloft, pink cuticle shoes bound to black feet. She removes her head, wears it cocked on an indigenous crown. Hot day on the square, she fumbles through her drawstring knapsack for a water bottle, detaches the native skull, sits it on the mini-mini within. This is submit resist. Because really, I'm not really good at resisting. Sometimes I just like give in. I'm terrible, you know? Submit resist. Submit to the line of students as questions. Resist their tall tales. Submit to the stage of the classroom. Resist the despair of unpreparedness. 
the blank stairs, blank papers. Submit to the penal scholastic, resist the hourly rage. Submit timesheet, essay, humility, resist the conspiratorial bank. Remit, subsist, submit to the clutch of the breast, resist the song of the uterus, submit to the will of the crotch, to the ass jet, to the bike seat. Resist memory, failure, humidity, submit to the one breeze, resist gerunds, submit to the peripathetic, resist the howl of the building dawn, submit to the raindrops on the air conditioner, resist the caffeine tremor, Submit to the sweat lodge. Resist the butter cookie. Submit to the butter cookie. <laughs> Resist the baby squeal behind the neighbor door. Submit to architecture and its facades. Resist gatekeepers. Submit to disorientation, to starting over and again. Um, I wrote this for Monica Hands, um, who passed away not too long ago, great poet. Great editor, organizer, just many things. Um, this was for a website called Word Peace. And it was for Eric Garner, because um, she liked the stuff that I was posting on Facebook about protesting that way. Um, so yeah, Garner Verdict Night, December 3rd, 2014. One, meeting the march at 50th and Broadway. Dropped, actually in the pictures too, so. Dropped grading papers as soon as I heard. I had more to teach by walking. Marching was morning. I felt I knew him. Neighbors from remote ghettos, like someone I grew up with, surrounded by white ethnics in the sticks. His video ghost told me there was no question I had to be there. Two, sit in at Columbus Circle. We sat down in a crosswalk, Christmas lights of the corporate mall winking. This couldn't be done under Bloomberg. He corralled, blocked, barricaded, made people believe they had to ask permission to protest, to breathe. Never felt more of this city than when I took my place on that road. Three, between the buses down ninth. Against traffic down wide Manhattan Avenue, eyes and back of head, many marchers the age of my students, I fell back to watch them move was solo among groups of various sizes, could observe, weave, join, break, let one know where the other was, if they were lost, coming apart. Flag on West Side Highway. There had been honking in solidarity on the previous block, but here we waded a river of cars the size of what was gone, wrong. A police wall met us, shields and helmets, outfit of control. Before it, our own river of bodies waved, pulsed, chanting his last words. Um, all right, I'm gonna do one last, like, sort of politically one. I can find it. And this is for, where is this one? Hang on. If I can find it, if I can't find it, oh, there it is. This was uh, for Joanna Furman. It was the year of the erupting tenements. It was the year of the erupting tenements, of getting used to nothing, of feeling lucky that it wasn't us the city ate. Uptown and down, the indigenous were caught in the rubble. The phantom residents of the instant glass towers above were revealed and no one blinked. Their decentralized funds erased us, made us Dubai and Kuala Lumpur, Kuala Dubai, gleaming and vacant. Our rents moved to the vigesimal system of the ancient Maya. We were hired to play versions of ourselves like Hawaiians in graffiti grass skirts dancing for cronuts. My one true hero was the mummy Buddha monk of Ulaanbaatar, stiff but alive, dusty in his rainbow body. I invoked him every time a new Brooklyn asshole decided I wasn't from there. I shut down, cross-legged, radiated anti-authenticity, my skin cells flaking as the asshole tried to move me to a museum lobby for sale. I let the roaming coyotes do the work of terrorizing the interlopers and the ghost rich. The MTA pitched in with their expertise in disorientation and abandonment. I decided on a meeting spot for after the temples fell in the uptown forests of Inwood and Van Cortland. Telepathically, I texted the t GPS coordinates to my friends, included a map of the secret bike trails there. 
Um, okay, now I'll do some other random things. Um, I'll do... Epic Laundry. A former nonprofit staff, staffer turned real estate agent tells me laundry is too political. He sends it out now. He can afford to. I am still in the laundry struggle, the managing of the cloth, the managing of the time it takes to manage the cloth, the hard labor of the destitute, heavy lifting and carting into a top floor elevator out, to, out the door to the street, home washer dryers, the stuff of TV fantasy. At the laundromat, I am confused for the worker ladies in my uniform of invisibility, braless in an old dark t-shirt and high water sweats, hair pulled back, strays flying loose, my robust skin of servitude, the washerwoman by a river, scraping rags on a board, changing your dollar for quarters. I don't have any on me. I don't know what's wrong with the machine. Don't ask me what I charge by the pound. <laughs> I have my own epic laundry like debt, weeks of neglect, panty shortages and crises, all the holy t-shirts that must be preserved. I am here for my zen penance, my workout in the back, sweating deep in the dryer heat, headphones on, dancing as I manipulate my rags. One owner admiring my zeal showed me her tricks, pulled me and my fitted bed sheet out onto the tiled floor, drawing me into her secret fold. I have since betrayed her with a facility closer to my home, my burden too great to wheel three extra blocks forsaking communion for convenience. I wash and fold with true toilers, non-owners, fabric slaves, loveless and rightfully so. We share no confidences, only questions like complaints. My devotion to repetition, precision creases, Roy G. Biv organization, all underground, unnoticed. My order private, don't ask me to do yours. Okay, I'm gonna do the um, River Phoenix one. Where is it? What's it called? No time back to that. Ah, super random. Notes on Dark Blood, River Phoenix's last movie. Uh, okay. Yeah, I loved him. So, River Phoenix's last role was as a one eighth Native American who did not have a name. He was boy. His hair was black, but his eyes still blue. He was very skinny. He died with about 11 days left on the film. The director remembered him as very gentle. He wanted to talk about the movie's story in the Q&A after the screening, but the story was River. There were a bunch of Native Americans in the movie. The only non-Native American playing a Native American was River. It was set in New Mexico. It started with the Anasazi, those ruins that are a city in a canyon. That might be Colorado. It starts there. You know there's going to be trouble. The lead lady drinks a bud and then strips a shoulder for a picture in front of the ruins. Vulgarity before the ancient. The lady is the cause of all the trouble. There was a very well cast dog or dogs that had a significant part or parts in it. The director narrates major gaps in the film. It is incomplete. The movie pauses on a scene, sometimes goes black, and we hear the director's voice. It is cheesy yet eerie, time stopping. Holes like the desert landscape where it is set, like river leaving. The director smuggled some parts of the film from one country to another. He didn't touch it for 10 solid years, 1999 to 2009. River died in 1993. I was studying abroad in Brazil. Brazil cried with me. Milton Nascimento, one of their biggest singers, was as big a fan as I was. He wrote a song to him years before. Such a spoiler now. It must be spoiled because it is spoiled. We know it is spoiled. River's character dies in the movie. We see a death scene. We see him act out his death weeks before he actually dies. It is all of a sudden in the fragmented movie, as all of a sudden as it was for all of us. There are times River gives Keanu in his delivery, and then later Joaquin. The dark phoenix lived. The dark one plays dark very well. Sad country singer, mean pop star, jealous Caesar. The light phoenix died when he played dark. Is it phoenixes, phoenixes? Is that where Phoenician comes from? There is no plural of phoenix. One dies and another rises from the ashes. There can only be one at a time. Ooh. <laughs> uh, I'll do uh, two more maybe. 
Um, Infinite WAP for Biz Marquis Alone Again and Jodie Foster in Contact. I will whip out this stupid loneliness. It will slip into the spinning rings, the blinding light, the wormhole of my hip, my neck, my back. I am okay to go into another dimension, a vision of vast idiocy and solitude. Release it through my otherly abled limbs. This solo woe will drop into the Mobius strip of my infinite wop, my idiot savant bop, and be transformed. A slowed forgetting, memory broken and pieced back to together by beat, body cracked dumb. I will hum myself into a universe of unaloneness and quadruple suns, wind into never before seen galaxies while staying in one spot. Chat up an alien who looks like my father and points me to the single dancers on the floor in their own heads, their own bodies, each a cosmos, alone until collision. I'm gonna do maybe one little one. I think about another, but I haven't tried this one, so I'm gonna try it. These are my, like, that's as close to love poems as I get. I really, whatever's with love, you know? Whatever's. Um, so this is whatever's with love. <laughs> it's worthless. That's what you get for thinking a vaporizer was an engagement ring. <laughs> he wasn't on his knees. He was opening his car trunk. That wasn't a ribbon undone. That was a black plastic bag. That sapphire wasn't a rock. It was a shaft. Those weren't vows. That was vapor. That wasn't vapor. That was smoke. A bill of smoke. A ring of goods. A haze. A daze. A mirror. What he wanted you to see. What you get for believing. That wasn't a promise. That was a cough. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Picard. That was that was great. That's wonderful. Thank you for all for coming. Thank you for everyone coming out tonight. Uh, I'm really excited about this event. Uh, we've dubbed it Voices of Resistance. Um, this, and for posterity, we are recording this event, so I'm going to go through. This is the greater suite of events that this is a part of, and just because we are recording it, what we've already done is it started last uh, Wednesday on the 15th. We did a documentary screening of the 2009 film Captured, uh, which is about Clayton Patterson and his documenting of the Lower, Lower East Side. Uh, he was on hand to introduce and do Q&A. Uh, we did something with the Interference Archive uh, here in the library on Wednesday. Uh, they came over and uh, talked about propaganda parties and how independent artists and designers can collaborate with community organizations to create and distribute their own political materials. I think because they are, they are an archive, I think they probably hold on to that ephemera. I don't know to what level they catalog it, so I won't speak of that. We had a crypto party about digital security. On Saturday, we had an art and feminism Wikipedia edit-a-thon, uh, which was really cool. Um, last night, uh, in partnership with the MFA uh, Department for Social Documentary Filmmaking, we had a screening over there on the west side, which was great. There was uh, a great one by uh, Missouri undergraduates. Apparently, they had a professional uh, editor, but uh, a great movie about uh, was it last year or the year before? There was a young gentleman on a hunger strike uh, because of some incidents in Missouri, but there was also some. All two slices of that seven grain bread you love and put it in the toaster, I don't know how to use. <laughs> I bury my head back into the New York Times and continue reading about the horrible state of the world. How can I think about toast when the world is going to shit? You seem less bothered by it as you sit down and spread, I can't believe it's not butter on your hot bread. It melts, it melts instantly because it's not butter. <laughs> I sip on my coffee, getting my mind ready for the bitterness of the day. I'm not coveting your toast, I'm just looking at it. Watching you enjoy it makes me happy. I am not bitter, it's the coffee that's bitter. I'm simply awestruck 
by how happy a piece of warm bread can make someone. I half expect you to have an orgasm right on the kitchen table. You don't though. You finish and get up to get ready for your day, which probably won't be as bitter as mine. Does eating toast make one feel better about his day? I'll never know. I hate the stuff. All I can do is hold on to my assumptions tightly, slowly squeezing the air out of them until they are as limp as I am. You continue to bounce around the house, humming some ridiculous song you heard on the radio. Part of me wants to tell you to shut up, but I sit and take it and sip on my coffee and read about our world, our city. I can't get the image of your toast out of my mind. It's distracting me now. I can't concentrate on what I'm reading. I slam the paper on the table. Thanks for having me. And thank you to my fellow readers who I'm fans of, all of you. Especially that one, Sheila. And Patricia. I work with Patricia. Olivia. Um, OK, so I'm just going to read poems. Um, I'll start out with this one's called um, get my phone out so I can see the time. So this is entitled Manhattan. With a modicum of grace, a smidge of integrity and intelligence, we move through this place like bumper cars, banging into walls, each other, clack clash of voices, screams, and throated violence. The niceness is cutting, cordial but with an edge or telling someone's mama. People are people, even when they are being inhuman. The city can bring out the beast in the best of us, knocking down sky skyscrapers, eating homeless people for lunch. Toast, a monologue. And I just have to say, like, um, before I continue, about, like, politicizing issues like I feel like everything is political right now um, and including the body including relationships including our food like everything's political so this is toast the monologue I'm not much of a breakfast person I love my coffee I love the bitterness of the morning you love toast though I watch you every morning take out. You're dressed at this point and look at me startled. I'm ridiculous in pajamas, pissed off at toast. I go around collecting men. On Manhattan streets lit like Christmas, the avenue gives night on a plate. This time, in an adult bookstore, a glance, a hand, whose breath is this? Who's the one in anger? Outside, there is a fuck across the street in the truck. He rolls down his window, gives a grin, an avenue is crossed. Door to door. In a suit, I went door to door. The steaming hot sun staring at me like God's golden eye Knocking on doors, I gave witness to all of his fine works. Quoted Bible verses, made Jesus my lover. Sometimes my mother was with me. Other times she was at home pleasing the father in other ways. Out in the streets, I was spreading his word, making him proud of me. I sat on plush couches in nice houses, a little black boy in white people's homes telling them about Jehovah about the paradise earth his followers would inherit. My father, a void, hangs over me now without a word to anchor his soul. Close, four. Cashmere, I want to dress my tongue in it. All the recent protests in New York and DC were documented um, and uh, Standing Rock and quite good and now we're tonight. And tonight we have a great poetry reading. We have Picard Wilson, we have Sheila Maldonado, we have Lydia Cortez, and we have Patricia Spears Jones. So, um, welcome. Right. 
Um, so, first up, and this this microphone uh, is not projecting; it's recording. So that's just so you know. Uh, so first up, we have Ricard Wilson, my good friend. Uh, Ricard Wilson is a fellow of Kava Kanan, an alumni of the Squaw Valley Community of Writers. He has performed his work at the Bowery Poetry Club, the Poetry Project, Project the Studio Museum of Harlem, and the Asian American Writers Workshop, among others. His poetry has appeared in the Vanderbilt Review, Stretching Panties, The Brooklyn Rail, and Flicker and Spark, a contemporary queer anthology. A native of Memphis, Tennessee, Picard received his BA in English from Vanderbilt uh, and his MA in Creative Writing at City College. He is an adjunct professor uh, of English at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, CUNY. Please make Picard feel super welcome. Thank you. I can't help but look at the Ai Weiwei right here, which <coughs> like is resist. Like this looks, this is resist to me. Like in the way he deals with, China, with his art. So that's what we need to be doing. Um, thank you, uh, David, for inviting me. And thank you to the School of Visual 